CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Yeah, it's sort of unusual to see you sitting there instead of uh, hiding in the booth. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Arlington School Committee. Today is Thursday, September 26th. It is now 6.33 p.m. Um, tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded and also simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Uh, we have two members who are coming in remotely, Ms. Exton and Ms. Morgan. Ms. Morgan has a sniffles. Uh, Ms. Morgan, can you speak to us so we know your mic is working? Yes, hi. Good evening, and we have Ms. Exton who is taking a course and will be popping in and out. Can you speak to us, uh, Ms. Exton? Yep, good evening. Good. Um, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you're asked to provide your full name on, in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Further, all participants are advised that people may be <coughs> listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to, to identify themselves. Finally, both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials, and also found on the town's website, <coughs> using the Novus Agenda platform. Good evening, everybody. We begin with public comment, and there is nobody signed up for pub public comment. We also do not have um, ACE, Arlington High student representatives. So the next up is ACMI funding. We have a delegation from ACMI if you come forward and sit in front of a microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you need to be by a mic so that. Uh, you can be heard. Y'all, y'all, no, no, never mind. You can, we can hear you uh, in the room because you, you know we're broadcasting. We won't all talk at once. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Okay. Ready? Mr. Leone, would you introduce your team and... Uh... Yeah, good evening. I'm John Leone. I'm the president of ACMI. I've been the president since 2006, I believe. Uh -huh. I've run that with, in conjunction with Norma Cloud, our executive director, and Jeff Monroe, our operations manager. Jeff was my first hire and Norm was my second, then I stepped back and let them run the place. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in the unusual position. Um, Norm's gonna speak more to this, but over the last five years, we've lost approximately one third of our funding for, to, due to cable cutters. Um, and we have a series of slides to go through with, with, with you so that we can explain more and why we're actually here. So if we want to Say, say something first in the slides. Or? Go ahead. Yeah. Anything to say? Go ahead. No? Go ahead. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be here. The slides are a little bit out of order. Could you move forward to the next slide? And the one I'm looking for is right at the end. I, mean, I apologize for this con confusion here. Way at the end. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. That one. All right. <laughs> Thank you. It's all done. Uh, yeah. One before that, please. Yeah. Uh, let me explain. Um, ACMI has been in existence basically since 2006. So the past 18 years, we've been providing services to the town of Arlington uh, in terms of its uh, our coverage of any and all events that Arlington uh, wants us to cover. And generally, people expect us to be there. And the problem is right now, the problem is right now, we can be there. But um, we're reaching a point where our funding has been decreasing, as John expressed to about a third of what it originally was. We've lost about $375,000 since 19, 2018 to now. And that's right, per year. Problem in doing, and what, because of that, is the, it's a question of staffing. I can't fill certain slots right now to allow us to cover events that you might want us to cover or the town might want us to cover. In terms of our coverage for activities in the school, what you're seeing right now is just basically a, 
just a, a surface uh, of what we normally would cover for the, the, the school committee, and, well, for the, for the educational department in uh, Arlington. For example, live concerts, event coverage, including graduation, live sports coverage, uh, all sports, baseball, basketball, uh, football, you name it. Thank you, and hockey. I'm not a sports guy. Uh, the, other, the other lines up there you're saying is Focus Media, a club for filmmaking, Your View, Ponderscope. Those are programs that the students themselves have developed with our, uh, tr with our training them to, do, to, to, to train them to do television production. Uh, other, we also have been involved in, in the Audison Middle School from day one. My feeling was that we had to train students at a younger uh, age simply to allow them to understand television production. So by the time they reach Arlington High School, Ponder Scope, or whatever group is with the, 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 they have developed as students, they understand television production and they'd know how to cover a football game, for example, or to cover a concert, <coughs> or to cover any event that, that you folks would, or the, the school would like us to cover. Summer fun, we have a program in the, in the summer, a one week program, and we train students, middle stu students as well, for the entire week. And those students, many of those go on to work uh, as volunteer students to cover various events throughout the town, not even just for the education department. Can I see the, in the next slide? Um, I'm sorry, should, if you could go back to the very first one and then down one, I'm sorry. Oh, you missed it. Not that one, the next one. Do my best, sorry. Yes, <laughs> right there. I'm so sorry. Um, this, is in, this information is coming from Nielsen. And I think we all know what Nielsen is, watching the television and viewing habits uh, of the population in the country. This is just a quick overview. Streaming services are increasing. Cable subscribership is decreasing. And that's where our problem lies, because our funding does come from strictly cable subscribers in Arlington, from RCN, uh, Verizon, and Comcast. And we get maximum federal allowable 5% of their income comes to us. The fewer people who are subscribing means less money. More people are going to streaming services. And therefore, we're, we're hurting. That's why we're losing $325,000 a, a year. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. That is a, an example of Massachusetts cable subscribers from 2013 to 2022. Major drop. More people are cutting the cord than we thought. If you go to the next slide, that comes from WGBH, and that's an indication of where, where they were thinking that live TV is decreasing in terms of video consumption. Nonlinear TV, meaning st uh, streaming, is increasing. The cutover, the, the point where they meet is summer of 2022. If you, if you project to the future, more people will be nonlinear, fewer people will be watching live TV. That crossover point in 2022 is when we start to realize our funding suddenly drastically dropped. So, so streaming has become an issue for us. Uh, there, have been, there has been a bill introduced in the state legislature that would allow uh, all, cable, all cable community television stations in, in, the, in the state of Massachusetts to obtain funding. Unfortunately, it did not pass. It, what it meant was the town would have received, uh, town would have received, no, I mean, so the state would have received 20% of whatever funding streaming services were providing, like Hulu, Netflix, those types of streaming services. And the town would receive 40%, and we would receive 20%. 40%, I'm sorry. But unfortunately, that bill did not pass. So maybe next legislative session, it will. So we're back to the situation now where our funding is extremely low and I cannot hire a youth coordinator. All of what I described earlier, all those activities, very difficult at this point for one person or two people to try and cover those. I say one person because a lot of this, this coverage is from Jeff Monroe. <laughs> Jeff, is a guy, Jeff is a guy, we talk about him being cut into three or four different slots, slash him around, spread him around but it's unsustainable. He cannot cover all football games, all basketball games, and do concerts, and do what his other up jobs are at ACMI tech, from a technical viewpoint. He, he is handling the, the looking forward to the streaming aspect of this, and ACMI has always been forward-looking. We actually have been streaming for a number of years, and many people don't know that. 
So, Jeff, I'm going to ask you to describe what we've done in terms of our purchase of a brand new server that offers many different opportunities for people to watch ACMI if we have content. <laughs> right. That's the main thing is all of the content that we create, that we put on the channels. A lot of people don't know we have three channels, a public education and government channel. And the output goes to, you know, this is behind the scenes, things that are hidden at ACMI over at Park Avenue. That's our distribution center. So we have a server there that we program to play all of the programs that are created during the week. And we also play archive programming and we also play bicycle programming. So we need the content. And as we have less people creating the content, um, we just grew our network to be, allow for streaming live on our website. We're gonna be streaming live on uh, Roku, so folks that don't have cable can still tune into our live events. Um, and we also will live stream to YouTube at times. So we are growing as, a, as far as our infrastructure and the support tech of the technology. And our cameras and things like that are still available. We're training more people. We have a lot of folks that we are saying, I'm sorry, I wish I could be there. I wish we could do a multi-cam project the way we have in the past. We're just kind of watering some of those projects down. Things like the football game, I'd like to remind everyone that we have 15 students assist with the first three football games at home, mm -hmm. which was incredible. That is a large number. Uh, most of them seniors, and of the seniors that are with us today helping us with projects, they have been a part of the ACMI program since they were in middle school, and some of them from when they were in middle uh, elementary school. And this is the thing where without the support at the elementary level of allowing kids to get involved in media, and then in middle school we had a champion in Edith Moisan for many years, where she actually developed a, a TV program and we were there maybe every other week mm -hmm. training new students and then those students would then move to the high school and be very active participants. So there's no feeder group currently. Mm -hmm. um, and with the uh, resignation of our youth coordinator and we can't rehire our youth coordinator, that's where this uh, coming to visit you all and bringing you up to speed on our situation mm -hmm seemed very appropriate. So I don't know if there's any questions. We'll be glad to answer any if you have them. Uh, just one, one other comment. Uh, Jeff pointed out, pointed out these, the students who are volunteering are seniors. But as you, just to reiterate, we don't have kids coming up at this point. It can't, can't be just Jeff and only Jeff. And Katie Chang is the other production manager that we have. It can't be just those two people trying to train, train everybody. So that's where. It, push comes to shove, we need to we need additional funding here if we're going to survive. Because if you look at the GBH slide, they're projecting more people streaming, which means less income for us. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a major problem. The last one is the ACMI budget. It's self-evident. It's, it's dropped tremendously since 2018. We're down to about 680,000 at this point from close to a million mm -hmm. from 2018. It was dramatic. And all stations across Massachusetts and the country are experiencing the same thing. So um, I, I wanted to add one more thing is in 2006 when we started mm -hmm. is also that coincided with the um, retirement of Ed Sullivan, but, uh, the, the TV teacher mm -hmm. and also the AV tech at the high school. So we did take, o take on a lot of the AV assistants. You know you've seen me in this room many times trying to get this room up and running. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to be there, uh, trying to be many places to make sure that the town is functioning and we can, we can do what we need to do um, as far as the media technology goes. So basically why are we here? Um, why don't we switch back? <laughs> as you know, we, by our contract with the town, we have, uh, we're obligated to cover the school committee, select board, and town meeting. Mm -hmm. at, at our height we had Eight, nine employees. Actually, I, I was tracking to the double, tracking myself. It was actually eleven. Yep, and down to seven. seven. Right now we have seven. Seven employees. Mm -hmm. With those seven employees, we're not able to cover 
all of the things that we were able to cover for you, for um, the town itself, and to provide all the services to the kids that we like to provide, and for the parents mm -hmm. and the school committee yourself. These are your cameras, mm -hmm. but we run them. Mm -hmm. Without us here, as Paul said earlier, ACMI is covering you. To do that, as you can see on our budget, we're, we're strapped. Mm -hmm. Other towns, two, at least two other towns you know of, Lexington and Brookline, no, or is it Newton? Newton. Newton. <clears throat> they give their um, cable access station, which we are, Arlington Community Media, which is renamed our, we named ourselves early on, having a forethought that computers were going to start becoming more and more um, integral to the day-to-day -day life of everybody. So we are there, we're at the cutting edge of everything, but we can't have the money. Mm -hmm. So we're here to ask you to put us into your budget cycle. We are also gonna appear before the FinCom mm -hmm. and the Select Board, and we've already met with Jim Feeney last year, mm -hmm. but we're hoping early enough this year so that when you guys write, write your budget, you can work something out between you and the town. Mm -hmm. We need $200,000. Um, whether it's all from you or half from you or two thirds from you and a third from the town, however you guys want to split it up, we're going to have that same ask. Mm -hmm. And we're just asking to be put on the cycle so we can continue to do what we've done and keep the services that we provide mm -hmm. to the town up. We have tightened our belts. Like I said, we're down to our seven employees. We've had to close our Studio B, which mm -hmm. used to be on Mass Ave, then we moved to over on Summer Street, which um, we had that studio there to service the kids and the high schools, and it was close and easy to access, but because of budget constraints, we have eliminated that. Mm -hmm. We've also begun a campaign of asking our subscribers for money, and, and we're developing a campaign to go to the businesses in town and to other people to sponsor um, the different channels or the different programs at different levels. Mm -hmm. But frankly, that's... I don't want to denigrate the amount of money we can raise, but if everyone gave a five dollars, I mean, it's going to raise a couple hundred, couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. We need a real. We would like the town and the school committee to match what we're seeing other communities in the state are doing, and we think it's going to become more and more prevalent um, in order to keep the services we provide. You know, we're basically your. The, default news program for the town with the default go-to um, and we think we provide a valuable service and so want to keep doing it okay are there any questions, questions, questions or comments from the committee uh, mr. Cardin um, so in relation to that I think it would be helpful if you developed a budget on how much it costs to broadcast these meetings because that's sort of the fee-for-service that we would be Con that we already contract for you to do, but you're not paid yeah. for it. And then the other stuff that you do in relation to the high school and the, you know, again, sort of, you have this amorphous ask for $200,000, but, you know, sort of what is that buying us, right? If all of your other funds dry up, which eventually they're going probably mm. going to do, right. what, what are we going to have left with for that amount? Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, thanks very much. It's good to see you guys, and I know how valuable you are to the town. I, <clears throat> in terms of the middle, so that I'm trying to understand the chronology, the, the, the middle school, the, the younger student programming has stopped because you don't have personnel. Is that what it is? That's right. Be right. Between that and the, the school system, and, uh, there's no one at that level. For instance, we did have a, a partner in the media center helping curate students that would have an interest and then they would coordinate with ACMI to come in bring equipment drop off equipment do the training and it was part media literacy programming mm -hmm, yeah. and it was part technical like okay mm -hmm. this is the button you push and mm -hmm. um, and we would do soup to nuts like from idea all the way to editing and then distribution so those and that was at the middle school level yeah. so by the time those those folks know went into the high school they knew who ACMI was but they were very familiar with the equipment but also with the need so we would even have at that time middle school students assisting with high school projects mm -hmm. 
because they were just very proficient in whatever area of production they were learning mm -hmm. and, um, and just wanted to help out. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a great community of youth for those years that we had Edith uh, yeah. curating and supporting that group. But we don't have anybody, uh, and I think that was before the Gibbs split. Mm -hmm. So we okay, don't have anybody well, at Gibbs. No, it, it, la it went beyond yeah, that. It's fairly recent. Sure. Yeah. The, Go ahead. Um, Edith Moisson retired um, post-COVID, so like yeah. a couple of years ago. Uh, Brendan Mahoney took over the program when Edith retired, but she has now moved up to the high school, so there's nobody at the Audison that has like the, the skill background at the, at the time to run it. We've got the, the space for it. We've got a green room in the media center all set up for this. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, absolutely. So um, it's, it's something that I think there's still interest in. It's just not having the right person in the building at the mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, so I just, that's what I wanted to clarify. If I can continue, Paul. So does the, does the district have an interest in this? Liz? Does it have what? An, in, an interest in this partnership? The, the Yes. I mean, the, yeah. the impact of the programming, the extracurricular programming, and the learning that the students have done that's mm -hmm. very, it's, it's aligned with their interest. It's, they follow it up through high school. And it's been noticeable during my tenure here, um, to Miski's point, the, I've watched the program exist at Audison, exist less at Audison, exist now at the high school, um, and I, my understanding is that UVU is not operating this year. Right. Right. Um, being interviewed by UVU and knowing the kids in that program and now that having that be gone, and, and it's sad to yeah. see that it's not there anymore and that, that, that the amazing work that you all have done to build sort of a, a capacity to staff some of these other events and to give kids that kind of internship opportunity is not there anymore. Well, I think, okay, so I think to Mr. Cardin's point that you, it would be great to get the a budget that really, you know, identifies what allocation of your total budget is supporting the schools in any way and then what additional money is needed to support the schools in any way. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the FTE you need to add for that that to, to, to uh, uh, support what the superintendent and uh, Julie just explained. And then, um, you know, what we're spending now, how much of your time, the, you know, the, your staff's time, that sort of thing, equipment, I don't know. So that we, we would need to know. And then we should have a conversation here, I think you're right, about since it's benefiting the schools and the school committee in particular, and the public to learn about our work, you know, what that, what that costs, and then we have to figure out where it would fit in our budget. But I think we need more than $200,000. I think you need to be more specific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Allison Ampey. I agree with what my fellow members have said. Um, I think it would be good to have a list of the stuff that you have done in the past and how much manpower that entailed, uh, both mm -hmm. personnel and volunteers. And so we have a picture of what was mm -hmm. and then what you're proposing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it doesn't just benefit us, though. It also it, it benefits the town. And it is yeah. something that we're going to have to figure out how to have a discussion with the town because I think it needs to be a joint right. uh, thing. But we need to look beyond just your 200K and think about you know, what you're saying is that you don't have enough content and what, how can we rebuild your ability, or, or not we, how can you, and how can we help you rebuild your ability to generate the appropriate amounts of content and <coughs> does that come from us or does that come from <coughs> somewhere else? So, well, the, the the content that we're talking about is is content is generated, quite frankly, from both the students and from us. So, so the the problem is, I've got a very creative staff, a million ideas. I've got a lot a lot of wonderful students who come in and want to do a lot of things. But the, it boils down to who's going to what be with them to train them, number one, and teach them how to do this. And because, I, again, because of the limited staff, the, the major issue here is staffing. But I, I, the letter I wrote to you folks and to uh, FinCom and to town uh, indicated there were two part-time positions that were, were open, I can't fill them, and the one full-time position of a youth coordinator. They, they, that, the youth coordinator, it was the key. 
<clears throat> we needed somebody to to take care of the football, take care of coverage, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, but in terms of content, we generate that, or that youth that that youth coordinator would be the, the one who generates it, along with the students. But right now, we we don't we can't do it. Well, that that's what I meant is yeah. that what's needed yeah. to push out so mm -hmm. that then you have the content generated. Yep. And when you say you can't hire, you mean you don't have the funds to hire or with your given funds you can't? We don't, we don't have the funds to hire at okay. this point. Okay, so that's, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. That. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> quite frankly, there's a limit in Jeff Monroe's time <laughs> yeah. to be right. able to yeah. cover yeah. everything. Right. You know. We need to clone him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to clone him. Mike, please. <laughs> our, our last youth coordinator, Jasper Hamilton, was a product of the Arlington Public Schools, success story, went off to production, um, and he started our filmmaking program with the students, and it was a wonderful number of years while he was here. And it was sad to see him go, but he was leaving ACMI to pursue his filmmaking career mm -hmm. and finish writing a bunch of his films that he's been writing. Um, but when he was in high school, he was one of one of a, a, a very vibrant high school group. They're all still best friends today. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's a testament to the community that we've built and fostered over the years. So I, I do hope to get back to it. Uh, and we're trying to keep as much as we can together at, at the moment. Any other questions or comments? Um, you're pointing in a direction. I wasn't sure if we're. Uh, um, I, I've got an eye on them. If okay. uh, any anybody in uh, Zoom land, uh, I just make oh, one suggestion. As you, ahead, as, you Mr. Mr. as you work Mr. on the budget, you want to be in touch with the budget. We have a budget subcommittee on the school committee, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's just good to kind of go back and forth with the chair. <laughs> Dr. Allison Ambie <laughs> chairs the budget subcommittee, and that's the one thing I would have said uh, is that yeah, I mean. I'm sure you'll get an invitation from her to have a conversation sometime between now and December as we're starting the basics of putting the budget together. Well, that's what we were hoping, to get in early enough mm -hmm. in the process yep. so that we could get whatever you would need from us so that we can get your feedback so that we can cooperatively work together mm -hmm. to figure this out because, you know, we want to continue what we've done. Mm -hmm. we, we like serving mm -hmm. the town. We like serving the committee. We love serving... Um, community and the children and I think we've had a lot of really good success over the years unfortunately mm -hmm. we're just put in this bind where we just can't can't keep doing it okay dr. Holman um, as we're entering budget process I think uh, one of the things that we do as part of that process is that we hear from administrators about the programming that they would like to see happen at their schools so some connection with OMS, um, the principal there was an assistant principal when this programming existed and so would have familiarity, Principal Rubino, with um, what the impact was, the students that participated mm -hmm. in it, and Dr. Janger about um, what it could look like to partner up with the schools around FTEs or programming that could potentially be mutually beneficial mm -hmm. um, might be useful for developing what the school committee and I agree with them um, are saying which is to give us a fuller picture of what the what we had what we've lost what we could gain back um, by working with you on this so mm -hmm. I'd recommend connecting yeah. with them yeah. too uh, Mr. Leone, I know that you are very much aware of how the budgets work in the town. Exactly. Uh, so I, I appreciate the fact that you're here tonight and early in the process. Uh, I think that, uh, just personally speaking, that I, I value your services. I'm also one of those evil cord cutters, and I'm... Oh. Yeah, I, yeah. So I mean, maybe someday the legislature will let us get our 5% to your streaming, but until they do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, if there's a permanent solution from the legislature, don't hold your breath. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, we have to make this a, a sustainable program, and obviously we had a dedicated funding stream that's drying up, and we have to find an alternative. And given the complexities of town budgeting, uh, yeah, exactly. we have to figure out how... I, I think there's a will in the community to do this, but we have to figure out how we're going to do it and what the expectations are 
on both sides of the street uh, for supporting, sustaining you and the services you're going to be providing. Um, agreed 100%. I just want to, a lot of people, mm -hmm. the citizens, think we are part of the town mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't realize we're an independent nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. They just assume ACMI is going to be there. They assume we're going to take care of this. They assume we do this. And we have been able to, but now we can hopefully work with you on the town half of the budget and keep it, keep it going. In the interim, if uh, somebody is sitting out here watching this now because they're able to watch it thanks to ACMI and they want to show appreciation monetarily, how would they go about doing that? There's a donate button on our website, acmi.tv. Okay, let's all upper, go upper find upper that donate button on the acmi.tv. Yeah. Uh, and, and you could volunteer. Okay. You can volunteer, yeah, to mm -hmm. help you know, cover some of these town events. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Saw your people out on town day. It was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you all for you. taking thank the time you. to meet with us. Next up, uh, some daffodils. Um, Beth Locke, uh, I think, is uh, for this uh, item. Uh, Beth, can you hear us and can we hear you? Yes, hello, thank you. Thank okay, you for having we me. We got you there. Go ahead and um, identify yourself. Yeah, I please. signed in the wrong way earlier, so I'm glad I figured this out before it was my turn. Mm -hmm. I had been hoping to attend in person and wasn't able to, but uh, my name is Beth Locke. I'm the executive director of the Arlington Chamber of Commerce, and I'm also a member of the Arlington 250 Committee. We're planning the events um, around the commemoration of the beginning of the Revolutionary War and the Battle of Monotomy reenactment and all the things that will be happening in conjunction with that. Um, the Chamber has put together a project where um, we would like to, where we're going to purchase mm -hmm thousand daffodil bulbs and plant them on properties along the reenactment route. Um, you folks may know that the reenactment starts at Grove Street and goes down Mass Ave to um, Medford Street. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have identified a number of properties along Mass Ave that have, you know, what we think will be good soil and a good area to plant these daffodil bulbs. <laughs> They will bloom on or about uh, Patriot's Day weekend, so the timing is perfect. Um, and we've received permission already from the town, from the select board earlier this week to plant on um, a number of town properties. And we're asking the high school if we could plant around 500 bulbs on the front lawn in the beds that already exist there. Um, the, we're also going to be talking to Brookline Bank and Leader Bank, which are directly across the street, about planting in front of their buildings. And um, there's a skirmish. If, if the reenactment goes the same way it went last year, there's a particular skirmish that will take place right in front of the high school, right in that area. Um, and we would love to have these daffodils blooming there. Um, and then they'll bloom you know, they're, they're perennials, so they will bloom for many years to come, we hope, and beautify Arlington, you know, throughout the Mass Ave corridor. Okay. Questions from the committee? Do I hear a motion to grant permission to uh, install 500, uh, 2,000 bulbs at Arlington High School? Dr. Allison Anthony? I had a question. You have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I just want to know, do we <coughs> do we have someone that we can talk to at the facilities just to make sure that we're not, that it's okay? I mean, I'm happy mm -hmm. that we approved them, but I just want to be sure we're going through our facilities people to make sure that we're putting them where they should be and stuff. I would love to connect with whoever you have. Um, if, if there's a landscaper or someone who maintains those beds in the front, um, they're, they're very, you know, be professional beds. So <laughs> we don't want to do anything to disturb them. But I, I mean, I'm, we also want to make sure we put them in the right places. I, I feel comfortable that we will, but I'd rather have somebody to connect with on the building. 
Um, Mr. Thielman. I think we have someone who man maintains the, 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 mm -hmm. the outside, do we not? I think we are working on that. Oh. At the moment. Um, you know, the superintendent. I mean, we have, a, we have custodi we have grounds mm -hmm. custodians who do some sort of basic maintenance when on occasion have had um, or explored, gotten quotes for folks to come up for, to contract it out. Yeah. But we don't have a contract in place for a professional who comes to maintain those beds. That said, we do have like, the, it was just completed. So we have the maps of what plants are where and mm -hmm. can probably get information about where it would be most appropriate to plant without damaging something else that's in the bed mm -hmm. from the building project. Mm -hmm. um, and so we could get that information and probably continue working on what our maintenance plan is. So Beth should be in touch with Mr. Gorski or you? I believe Mr. Gorski. Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think okay. we, we, you just at the point of contact will be the chief financial officer. He's got a better title. Um, <clears throat> and then that'll take you where you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I move that we allow Beth to plant all the bulbs she wants to plant. <laughs> In coordination <laughs> with the school department. In coordination with the school department, yeah. Thank you. And I promise that we will be very careful on those beds. I just was there today taking some pictures in case anyone had any questions. And I mean, I, I think it's going to be a, a, a good place to plant. And I don't expect that we'll disturb any anything that's already been planted there. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, we need to go to roll call vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative. That's seven nothing vote. Congratulations, happy planting. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I think it's going to be beautiful. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is Odyssey Middle School field trip discussion and possible approval. Uh, Superintendent. Sure. So I will hand this off to Ms. Carney. This uh, trip is a um, not domestic, but North American um, trip to Quebec for our middle schoolers and uh, Ms. Carney can tell you a little bit more about it. We are in the process of working on a strategy for trips that would have some restrictions around locality drivability for middle school trips um, and do international uh, isolated to the high school level and we're working on that. So that is forthcoming at some point this school year. In the meantime, we're gonna have proposals for trips come up and so I'll hand it off to Ms. Carney. Thank you. Um, I would actually like to hand it off to Ms. Mignol, who <laughs> has, um, has, has taken the lead and done all of the research on this. So take it away, Isabel. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Isabel Mignot, and I am the seventh grade French teacher at OMS. Uh, thank you first for giving, giving me the time tonight to talk about it. Um, I have the project to take a group of eighth grade French students to Quebec in May. And um, I, I strongly feel that our close location to Quebec really makes it ideal uh, destination and an ideal opportunity for students to be uh, immersed in the language and in the culture. Um, at that age, they've had three years of uh, language by then, by the end of the eighth grade year. And so I feel that they have strong enough foundation um, in order for that, to, in order to benefit from that trip. Um, I think Don and I also agree that it would um, it would be um, it would also such an opportunity such a trip would also build excitement for the French program um, in the district, uh, and I think both and I um, both uh, Don and I have um, colleagues a few friends um, in other school districts uh, Wellesley Lexington who have taken students to Quebec City in the past or are taking um, students this year uh, using the same travel agency that I've been working with. And we, um, I've had uh, excellent uh, feedback input from uh, my friends. Um, they both felt like it was a fantastic opportunity, very doable, and that it really created um, lasting memories for the students. So this is something that I'm very excited about and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Uh, members of the committee, I'm looking around. Um, do any of my remote people 
have a comment or question? You go to the, yeah, thank you. Okay, Ms. Morgan. Um, so since there's a school day missed for this trip, what's the plan for, so that basically means that the kids who don't go on the trip, you know, they don't have their language that day. Like what's the plan for sort of coverage? Um, how many kids do we expect will go? And how are we gonna make sure that everybody has school um, on the Tuesday after Memorial Day? I can answer this a little bit more thoroughly because we've we've done the planning about this. So um, uh, Isabel is the grade seven teacher, but the trip is for grade eight students because that's when we feel that they're ready. So the grade eight students won't be impacted. And one of the options is if I don't participate on the trip is that I could cover the French classes because French is the language that I speak. So I could actually take care. The students would have a real French class. If not, um, then we would have a, a, a sub just like we would for any other kind of field trip where their teacher was out for the day. Um, the plan for everybody coming to school on the Tuesday is like that's part of the contract. It's part of the behavior contract that they know they have to come to school on the day after the trip. Is, was that your question, right? Well, so it looked like I, 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 I had to get out my 2025 calendar because <laughs> it looked like there were two days of school missed, but one of the days is uh, oh gosh, Memorial Day or Labor Day, which everyone Memorial wants. Day. <laughs> yes. Ah! Um, so the May holiday or the May, June, it sometimes like bumps in. Anyway, that like end of school year, that Monday is already a holiday. And then mm -hmm. Tuesday, they're still away. So, and then the kids and teachers would presumably come back on Wednesday. I'm or, sorry. Um, yes. Yes. It's, I, it's fine. It's, it's just, it, it's neither here nor there. It's just that one day. Right. But mm -hmm. so, but if there are enough students that go, we would have more chaperones, right? So then there would be yes. more people who would be out that would need coverage. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So we've we've talked with Principal Rubino already and with enough advanced time, we would hope that we would be able to get substitutes lined up. In our substitute system, you can re request absences in advance and you can actually line people up. So that would be one of our priorities. And again, if I don't participate in the trip, I would, I would be at Audison for the day to provide some coverage. Okay, yeah, no, it's just, I, I, I know that. I think we just, we did a trip um, a couple of years ago and there were a lot of students that went and a lot of teachers that were out and it was, you know, it was tough. Yeah. It was it was pretty disruptive, frankly. It would not be of um, that scale. I, I, no, I, I mean, That's my sense is that it's not gonna be like 70 kids are not gonna go on this trip. No. No, yeah. no actually um, we are hoping for the maximum allowed um, to go in one bus, that would be 45 students plus five chaperones. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Elson Abbey. Um, <coughs> this was just a comment looking through it. My, my daughter had gone to Spain through APS um, multiple years ago. And one of the things that was mentioned during that trip was that parents needed to have a passport in case they needed to go get their kids from wherever and I think it's something given that we need passports to travel to Canada or at least I think we do mm -hmm. um, that both the students are going to need it but also you want to be sure you notify the parents that they should have a passport because that may not with a Canada trip I'm not sure it's something that will occur to everyone but that I didn't see it in the document, so. Okay, that, um, I, I don't remember that it's not in the document, so thank you. We are absolutely following the sort of I mean, AHS I may have protocol. missed it, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we will make sure that we include that. Thank you for the reminder. <coughs> Dr. Homan. I also, um, I should connect with you, Dawn, um, about some of what the documentation is that's going out because in the process of doing what I was speaking about before I handed it off to you, we've had legal counsel take a look at some of these documents and we haven't locked them in yet. Um, but in the event we can get that done before we have families signing some of this, uh, we should and it can explicitly mention um, along with, I mean, it does say that you may need to come pick your student up. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, maybe we could add the sentence Keep in mind that this may require you to have a passport, yeah. um, and so I'll I can mention that. So let's connect before anything goes out to families, if we can. Any further comments, questions from the membership? Hearing none, do I hear?
hear a motion. Mr. Thielman. I move approval. And a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, roll call. Ms. Exton? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative. That's a 7 nothing <coughs> vote. It's unanimous. Congratulations. Happy trails. <laughs> Thank you so much. We now go to the capital planning report. Mr. Gor uh, Mr. Gorski. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the budget, the capital budget committee has started planning for the FY26 through FY30 budget. Um, I've been asked to join the committee as the superintendent's designee. <coughs> Um, the committee develops a five-year budget plan annually. Um, in your packet, you have a memo um, that I can walk through. We can leave this up because it relates to um, the, the file here that shows the capital, the request and items that are currently in the budget for FY26 through FY30. Um, in the memo that I shared with with the school committee, there is definition of capital items, which include, based upon cost, at least $3,000, or generally a capital improvement. So if we're looking at roofing, um, plumbing, electrical, and the like. The district typically has had um, capital plan items fall under four categories. Information technology, which is include one-to-one -one academic advice, devices, uh, admin, computers, and peripherals, and a refresh of the academic PCs district-wide. We've had facilities, which has been a major, um, major source of the capital budget designated to the schools. Um, those have included boilers, RTU upgrades, roof repairs, office reconfigurations, <coughs> playground renovations, and envelope repairs. And that, those include windows and masonry. There's also sustainability, um, and that those generally come over from Talia Fox, who is the sustainability director for the town. Those include school solar arrays and weatherization projects. And then we have student transportation, which includes vehicle, repla vehicle replacement program. Um, one of the things, uh, obviously, there's funding that has been approved over the years. There's various projects that are in that have been improved, that are in design phase, there are projects that have moved forward to actually being worked upon. As part of the memo, I gave <clears throat> an update uh, for the committee on a few projects and continue to get updates from uh, Bob Jefferson, who is the interim facilities director, who uh, actually met with uh, Jim Feeney today to get updates on where various projects are, and I will provide additional um, information for school committee. but. One that was funded in the current year's capital budget is the Brackett School Playground. Um, that was funded at $800,000. The, the work began in July with the purchase of the playground equipment. Um, the demo began in August. And the playground equipment, weather permitting, uh, will be installed over the weekend. And then there's the, the flooring that if the weather, if we don't run into a rainy October, and the temperatures don't fall below a certain temperature level, which I believe is 40 degrees at night, the flooring will be able to be installed and the playground will be completed on or around October 31st. If the weather does not cooperate, um, the flooring will actually be installed in the spring and there'll be wood chips that will be installed so that the playground can be utilized. Another project that was outstanding is the Gibbs School Mezzanine Project to add additional classroom or classrooms. Um, plans were, an architect drew up plans a year ago. Um, one of the things I, I met with uh, Bob Jefferson and the facilities team to get a sense of where these various projects were in the process. So this is another one that's pending, but um, looking to get that project off the ground. And then another example is the Stratton main office renovation and office additions. 
So $400,000 was set aside to reconfigure the main office at the Stratton School um, to, uh, to add additional office space. Another project that has designs in place, I was over there with Bob Jefferson yesterday. Uh, looks like we have a plan to move forward and something that would be done in the upcoming vacation week. <coughs> So, as part as I mentioned, as part of this this um, file that we have here, we have ex existing items that were approved in the budget um, from FY twenty five through FY twenty nine. There are new requests that are for FY twenty six that also can fall in under different fiscal years, and then looking to extend certain programs into FY30. So the budget is basically going from an FY25 through 29 to an FY26 through FY30. As part of our new request, um, and I, I want to highlight a, a few items for the committee. One, in working with the superintendent and the IT director, uh, Patricia Shepard, looking at adding Chromebooks for paraprofessionals uh, with requested funding of approximately $210,000 over the five-year period of the, the budget, the capital budget plan. A AV refresh, which would be looking at projectors and smart boards, um, which would include, it, it includes an initial funding request of $844,000 for FY26 and approximately $2 million over FY27 through FY30. One thing that was purchased by the district in, in districts throughout the Commonwealth and throughout the country with CARES Act dollars were air purifiers as part of getting students back into school post-COVID and post being remote. Those air purifiers now have air filters that are reaching end of life. Um, they basically have a five-year lifespan the cost of the units of the filters are fairly pricey at $350 per unit. Um, the total cost of the request based upon 400 air purifiers would be about $140,000. Additional funding for elevator repairs. There's been issues with the Thompson School, um, at elevator, the elevator at the Thompson School, which is functioning but needs repairs. Um, there is $500,000 in the existing capital budget, but looking to add some additional funding to cover the cost of those repairs. The Brackett School, Bell and Intercon system, um, these systems typically have a 25-year lifespan coming to end of life. Um, the Dallin School recently had a similar project that came in at about $100,000. At the Dallin School, the number seven door, um, the door and the frame are deteriorating and need to be replaced. The cost estimate provided by the facilities department was roughly $20,000. And we had a recent request from um, Principal Janger at the, at the high school related to the turf and track, the turf at Pierce Field track at the high school. Um, the estimated cost is $500,000, but we've um, I've been working with the athletic director to see if we can get more f firm quotes because there's been quite a wide range in looking at what other um, communities have paid for turf replacement. The turf is okay for now, looking to put you know, kind of a marker in the capital budget plan for FY27, and that number can be adjusted as needed. One thing that I'd like to point out for, for the committee, um, and I think that this has been a change over time, is that the, the capital budget committee in working with facilities, in working with the district, has started to change how they budget in the capital budget plan. So previously, various projects were identified with one school site, and these are projects that you know could fall across all schools at a certain point. The example being the the RTUs, the ACs, boilers, um, you know, for a couple of examples, security upgrades. Uh, communication upgrades. So what the, what the committee has done is started to budget these as all school. It allows greater flexibility if um, there is a particular need at a school site within a given year 
that may not have been named in the capital plan. Um, and I think that was sort of the main things I wanted to highlight now. Allow the superintendent to weigh in that yep. she wants to add any thoughts before opening up for questions. Dr. Homan. Um, I will add that I think one of the constraints that we are consistently experiencing at this point is that devices and technology have been part of the capital plan at a, at a level of funding that hasn't really changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That the cost of those devices has changed pretty dramatically over time that we are now in a system where we have we used a lot of COVID funding to make sure that we could get up to one-to-one -to, -one to sustain hybrid and remote learning um, for a period of time. Those devices are now coming to end of life and replacing them on a routine refresh cycle that keeps students with a working, um, quick, like operating, easy to access the internet device all day long, which is where all of our curriculum now lives, um, costs more and so one of the conversations I know has happened with capital uh, planning committee is that they are those devices are not um, as they don't get they don't keep as long as they used to mm -hmm. um, they are sort of a necessary churn for the school system they're part of the curriculum um, and sustaining that one-to-one -one program over time is only going to cost more with time and so if those amounts don't grow in the plan then we're going to be hard pressed to maintain a one to one device program that's equitable and allows every student to have access to a similar device that we have the ability to keep safe, um, make sure that the right applications are on the device. So there are a lot of reasons why we provide the device for grades um, right now, K through six, and we really want to provide for K through eight and have some degree of BYOD at the high school. but. We're not at a place where seven through eight, we actually provide the device for every single student. Some students are still bringing their own. Um, so, and there are benefits to us providing the device. We can't do that yet because of the funding. The other thing that is, um, has not been approved in previous asks uh, by the Capital Planning Committee, but that we're putting in again, is this AV refresh for the classroom technology on the walls, the projectors. We have a lot of failing classroom, like basic classroom technology across the district. And we've been piecing together the replacements um, over time, a few here, a few there, uh, where we might have otherwise spent those dollars on different classroom materials. And so that's also, that's going to be reflected in the space and technology plan that we're gonna be developing this year. Um, the need for accessible, up-to-date classroom technology that can project lessons on the wall um, and be dependable for our teachers. So those are major items this year that we've added to the plan and that we intend to advocate for when we have our conversations with capital planning, understanding that there are a lot of demands that they need to weigh. Okay, Ms. Keyes is nodding. Um, <laughs> would you like I'm, to say something? I, I'm just thinking about like, we've had teachers stuck for months without a working projector because there's a fight going on over whose budget is gonna pay to replace the bulb. <laughs> Because, you know, the tech department says that's the school's budget, the school says it's the department's budget, the department says I don't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. So y having this be more systemic would be really awesome. I've seen that where I worked. Yeah. Uh, questions, comments from the committee? Mr. Cardin. Um, do we know which playground is in for 26? I know it, the playground is one of the things that was switched to all schools, but it's mm -hmm. a really large item. So I'm not sure that in that case it makes sense, but do we have a playground in mind for 2026 for $400,000? I believe it's Thompson. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I mean, that one, that's, that. uh, Mr. Gorski, I think that one's where, that's one of the items that doesn't quite make sense because there, there, there should be a plan on when playgrounds need to be replaced. There isn't but there's money in the capital plan to create that plan. Mm -hmm. And then that should feed into the capital plan rather than the sort of amorphous all playgrounds, $50,000 a year doesn't make sense. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yeah, just to add to what Mr. Cardin said, the other thing is that we don't own all of the playgrounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, the plan should be town-wide and then <coughs> be doing. Um, um, one question I had about the uh, documents that we received, there was one where it had pr 
proposed numbers and then it said approved. Is that approved by capital or it, I didn't know who that was, the approval was from. Which document, Dr. Al Sampi? I don't remember, it had multiple columns. You were showing it before, yeah. the multi-year spreadsheet. The SC capital plan document. So through the chair, I, I think I think I can answer that question. Go ahead. So th those are items that were have already been approved mm -hmm. as part of the FY25, FY29. So last year's. But, but by capital? By or? capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I wasn't and sure and if it was And then subsequently like by town meeting? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they just approve year by year. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I meant, I just wasn't sure if it was. <laughs> You approved them to pass on to capital, or if it was the in the capital plan. Okay, okay, that's what I didn't understand. I, I think um, to change. They rearranged the, the distinction. I was trying yeah. to draw there is that those are items that are currently in the plan, and then there are obviously new requests, and I, I would expect um, with different priorities that those out years will change. Obviously. Oh yeah, no, I just didn't understand what the, where the approval came from. Mm -hmm. wow. So, okay. Sure. One more um, comment: the the Hardy project, we should really take a look at MSBA application for that. Um, we haven't had the manpower, and you don't currently have the manpower to do that. But it's a two million dollar thing. It's it's perfect for that program, I think. So I would hope you take a serious look at that. The repair. That program is reopened. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Ms. It's every two years, I think, now, or, yeah. Ms. Morgan. So the 400000 for the playground, is that's what capital has approved? I mean, I think we all know that we're not getting a playground for $400,000. Like, that's not mm -hmm. what they cost mm -hmm. anymore. So, I, like, is that's what they've said? And then how are we going to actually get a playground with that? We can talk about that. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what that was, what the discussion was for that $440,000. So I, I can follow up um, with with the town and with the facilities director and get more information for school committee and rep report back at the next meeting. That'd be great, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not what playgrounds cost, so. <laughs> we, we either want one or we want to have a viable plan for getting mm -hmm. one. So mm -hmm. that'd be great, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Um, thanks for the presentation. My, the timing on this is, this is being submitted, it's done, isn't it? Or is it, where are we at with this? Um, the meetings themselves have just started. I, I was actually on the sub, drafted to be on the subcommittee meeting, the public, sub, public safety subcommittee. Um, so we had meetings with the police and fire chief, uh, the, the school department and the facilities meeting is actually next week. The process is really just beginning. Oh, it is just beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there is there a need for the this committee to take any action to support what you're doing? Or we need? To, I mean, I'm just trying to see if where we plug in, other than just being aware of it. I'm not trying to make more work for the committee. I think your input is this is it. valuable, yeah. and so like if there are things that you're seeing here, as Ms. Morgan mentioned, if we need to take another look at. Um, what we're asking for playground. I don't know if that was a repair of an existing playground. I know at the time that they were having the capital conversation, we knew that there were repairs required at Thompson. Um, and so perhaps that was put in as a repair. Since then, we've taken a whole bunch of equipment out, so maybe it needs to be a redo. So th flagging things like this or, or saying, where is that in the requests is valuable. Um, for us because then we can adjust the asks as we go. If we identify additional funding, we can say we found an offset for this and that's helpful in the capital planning process. They take another few months to determine what it is that's gonna land and what they propose then to town meeting. I do think in the context of conversations around long range planning and considering what our bottom line is gonna be for the year, um, where, some of, where some of these costs live could be part of that conversation, particularly as it might pertain to technology. Uh, but, okay. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Part of, just to follow up, part of the reason that this is being presented to us is that in the past, it was kind of being done 
without our eyes on it. Yeah. Which I'm not saying there was any problem with how it was being done, but then we would be asked questions about it. We're like, what? <laughs> and so we added uh, not so much an approval of what the capital plan requests were, but at least a presentation of what they are so that we were aware and now we have a chance to give some feedback. Um, and it's on our calendar, you know, on our yearly calendar of things that we want to hear at mm -hmm. this time. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, I wonder if the Budget Subcommittee wants to take a few minutes uh, talking in more detail about this or do you think we're in a good position? Um, Ms. Exeter has a question. I th uh, well, let me uh, okay. get uh, an answer from Dr. Allison Ampey, then I'll go to Ms. Exeter. Okay. I think we wait a little bit mm -hmm. and it may shape into long range plan discussions, which is definitely in our purview. Because the thing is, capital requests really would go to facilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, or should. Should, yeah. Um, that doesn't. And but if you want to do the work, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've got enough work. Um, anyway, but but if it's shaping into something which would need to be going the long-range plan, we can we can discuss. So we're, we're aware, and I'm sure we will be kept aware. Okay. Uh, Ms. Exton. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, can somebody just help me understand or sort of reframe the thinking around the turf and the track. We've had conversations about needing to change the emblem that's in the middle of it. It's not a part of the building project. Mm -hmm. Did we think it was going to last longer than it is? Was it not something that was going to get funded? And so now it is in here as an FY27 request. I'm just trying to understand where that falls in scope of the of the building project and the capital plan. I'm going to defer to the I conversation you had with Dr. Janker or uh, I think, I think I Dr. Allison Anthony may yeah. have an answer. So if I'm remembering correctly, it was last replaced in around 2014, 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it has an estimated life of about 10 years. Yeah. And traditionally we've gone 11, 12, 13. The problem is the players can, it, it deteriorates. It's mm -hmm. not it doesn't go fine and then suddenly get better. It, it gets worse as it gets older. Um, and so it is at the end of the life. I was trying to find our last estimate because honestly, I remember it costing a million. So I'm confused by the 500,000. Uh, and through the chair, that was the initial quote that I got from the high school, but I, yeah, mm -hmm. I do think that that's probably on the low end and certainly can be updated for the capital committee. Yeah, it, it's I I can't find my old records, but that's what I remember mm -hmm. off the top of my head. So I mean that'd be great. Maybe it, I mean it could be that the supply and demand has changed, and mm -hmm. that the you know there's more tires out there and stuff. So um, I don't know, but does that and and so as part of this is a total refresh. You know, normally there's just yearly maintenance done where they come in, they put some more of the pellets on and they shovel everything out and they make sure everything's fluffed and, and do stuff. But this is a total bring up the carpet, replace the carpet, and in this case we would want to replace the emblem um, and just totally redo the field. And it is to my recollection about time. Mm -hmm. So Okay, thank you. No, that's helpful. I was just trying to understand that where that sat. So, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? <coughs> Seeing none, uh, thank you, Mr. Gorski, for your presentation. Can I just say? Sure, go ahead. Congratulations. That was your first presentation <laughs> to school committee, and we're very glad you're here, Mr. Gorski. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, summer activities in PD report. Dr. Homan and Dr. Ford Walker. Mm -hmm. Actually, just Dr. Ford Walker. Okay. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to invite um, our director of multilingual learner education program, uh, Ms. Carla Brusacy, up. 
she's going to be uh, assisting tonight. Um, so you can actually run it. I'm very excited to share that we were able to provide our staff with a number of professional development learning opportunities over the summer. Um, and some of those offerings included specialized trainings on um, specific content. Also, we were able to provide some EL specific training to help support our new EL curriculum rollout. Also, almost every department participated in some level of uh, curriculum development and work um, at their um, in their specified subject and content areas. Um, some of the trainings that we were able to provide and offer to our staff include, included um, support on launching Lexia, which is one of our reading uh, supports. Also, um, some teams were able to dive deeper into planning for launching Lexia as part of the new EL curriculum. Also, some of the EL-specific trainings um, included uh, specific work <coughs> at every grade level, um, really around designing and implementing the new curriculum, and also around sp teaching specific elements of the curriculum that would support um, some of the module work that teachers are engaging in. Also, we were able to offer three-day Wilson training um, and safety care trainings um, with the special education department. <coughs> excuse me, student services. Um, in addition to that, we, a number of our educators participated in the ideas course that took place, uh, and also our literacy coaches did a lot of work to make sure that the EL rollout was a little bit more smoother than what our cohort one teachers experienced. So what I mean by that is there was some work that took place over the summer to um, make sure that Scope and sequences were updated and reflected um, some of the uh, suggestions around assessment uh, development and also some of the revision that needed to take place around some of the assessments. Also um, ensuring that <coughs> teachers were ready to go with copies and also uh, ready to go with um, some grade level specific additional resources and materials that our cohort one teachers found helpful. So our number of our literacy coaches worked to prepare those materials over the summer. In addition to um, our grade six uh, team working on developing uh, some of their curriculum at a glance documents. And um, also, some of our, the work that took place in our multilingual learner education program included um, some curriculum development work and also working on uh, some curriculum units, et cetera. Uh, one, oh, that back. One. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention is that we have a new K-5 health education um, curriculum that's being piloted at Stratton this year, um, Stratton and Dallin, and um, that's being piloted at the grade four and fifth grade uh, levels and our teams work to learn a little bit more about that curriculum and uh, up, in order for them to get up and running for uh, launch in September. Um, and finally, uh, there was some work that took place around um, some curriculum development and health and wellness. Um, our digital learning and library team um, continued the work that they've been engaging in around robots and micro bits and making sure that the, the units are um, reflecting the uh, DLCS standards and also making sure that uh, the library team um, had an opportunity to update some of the curriculum units that they're using with uh, students as well. Uh, our, in our math and computer science department, a number of our educators participated in um, professional development opportunities um, and some of those opportunities were in partnership with uh, Turk Investigations. Also, there was a number of um, a number of staff participated in developing curriculum again, um, and making sure that the curriculum that uh, students are being taught and our teachers are using is um, reflecting the needs of our students. Um, there are a number of opportunities that you can. Um, read through and kind of reference and learn a little bit more about. I won't go through every single opportunity, but just know that every department was really engaged in some really great curriculum planning and development work over the summer. Um, and, uh, 
Tell me when to uh, stop. One thing I do want to highlight is that you can go back one. Okay. And our data research and accountability department, and you'll be learning a little bit more about this. Um, our director, Matt Coleman, did a lot of work to um, build uh, our, our new data platform called Open Architects. And you'll, again, you'll learn a little bit more about that. But he did a lot of work to make sure that uh, the data that our teachers and school leaders have access to is uh, in one particular location a little bit more easily accessible. Um, and so there was a lot of work that took place around launching Open Architects as well. And our Family Engagement and Communications Department also uh, launched the APS Support Request Form and also launched the first edition of the APS Family School Partnership Guidebook. Some of the initial feedback that we're getting from families is that this is a super helpful tool and that uh, they find it very useful in terms of being able to know what our engagement opportunities are and how they can um, connect to schools a little bit more deeply. And finally, we were able to offer uh, two summer school programs. Um, I will say that we received a lot of feedback from families, and so um, we are going to be engaging in a process to um, make sure that our summer offerings are um, really meeting the needs and the requests of families in a different way this year. And so um, we're looking forward to doing some planning work throughout the year based on some of the feedback that we received at the beginning of the summer, but then also offering, offering opportunities for families to continue to give feedback to us to influence the programming. Uh, so our Title I program, so that uh, program took place at Thompson. It was the math and reading program. We had um, a number of students invited, but ultimately uh, we had about um, 60 students participate in the math component, 78 participate in reading, and 36 participate in both. And uh, that both of those programs were um, uh, really, um, I would say, impactful. Our summer school coordinators, Liz Farola and Michelle Crowley, um, spoke highly about how the program um, was received. But again, there's opportunity for improvement. And so we're going to be working on thinking through that this year. Um, and also our summer uh, school programming, our ML programming was run by uh, Ms. Puzesi, who will Yeah, share good an evening. Update. We had an elementary program at the Bishop School. And um, it's a newcomer program, and every year, um, I, th I think the next slide, it shows a lot of stuff. We have S SEI trained teachers, and some of the topics that we worked on at the elementary is, is a theme. And this year, they took the theme of the Olympics to connect it to what was happening in France. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great program, and when I, I on the prior slide, I talked about it's a true SEI model because... Um, the teachers that have been teaching in the program actually co-teach. So you have first and second graders together, together learning together academic language, and you have third, fourth, and fifth grade all together. And then we have great high school volunteers that get um, their high school hours in at the program. And we actually have some college students that are past Arlington student ML learners that want to come back and give, provide, you know, payback. And every year we get more and more requests for our people to come and volunteer. Um, I would hope next year, working with Dr. Holman, uh, Dr. Holman and Dr. Fordwalker, that hopefully we can invite you to attend and see it in, in session. And I'll, as Dr. Fordwalker has mentioned, planning um, a little bit differently because there were some hot days at Bishop with no air conditioning. So that's one thing that uh, I want to work with the district on. And then at the secondary level, it's a little bit different. It's it's more, um, we look at certain data. Uh, mostly reading and writing is a big one that comes out of the access scores in May. And so it's teacher, teacher recommendations of who would need some like extended learning over the summer. So it's more of a smaller program. We haven't, we really didn't, never had secondary programming until we had COVID and we had COVID funds. So we're able to keep that going with the Title III funding that we had because there was a need and an ask at the secondary level as well. Um, and then I just showed, it's really hard to get um, student photos without their faces when you don't have permission or families. But I wanted to share, um, I can always send a link to the to the school committee if you'd like to see the amazing work that was done at the secondary mm -hmm. as well as at the elementary. Mm -hmm. And then um, I took this opportunity tonight um, just to share uh, our great highlights of our ML pack. 
We're entering year two with the functioning ML pack. You know, we've had we've had issues in the past about having a family engagement. We have no longer any issues in Arlington with our multilingual learner families. I'm happy as of the other day, there are 15 families that are, are part of our ML pack. Um, they've created social media groups on WhatsApp to connect with one another, and I think Facebook groups they have on, um, a couple of the parents have taken leadership roles on that, and we have continued re recruitment ongoing on, and I wanted to invite anybody from the committee. Um, we have our first ML open house coming up October 10th at the Gibbs Cafeteria, um, and our next ML PAC meeting we usually have at the Robbins Library Community Room from 9.30 to 10.30 on the 18th, on the Friday, if you ever want to come and meet some of the families. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Any questions any, in general? Okay, any questions from the committee? Uh, Ms. Exton. Hi, thank you. Um, first, thank you very much for this, and I'm always amazed at all of the work <clears throat> that happens in the summer. Um, a lot of people think teachers don't do anything in the summer, and that is clearly not true based on what you've uh, shown can us Can you stop here. a second? We're having trouble hearing you. Oh. Sorry, is this better? No, not uh, it really. May, it may, you know, I wonder if it's the if it's, if it's headphones. Us. Yeah, I don't know. All right, hold on, wait. I can hear you just fine, it's, for what it's worth. Yeah, I think, so. yeah okay, so it must be hear, on our end, yeah. We can hear you just fine, though, Ms. Yeah, Morgan. We can hear you, I can. Okay. Can you hear, is it different, better now? A little. We'll, we'll live with just it. Just speak up a little bit, mm -hmm. you're good. Talk like okay. Classroom voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate all of the um, the presentation that you gave on all the things that happened this summer, um, and I it, I think it just speaks to how much teachers work in the summer. Um, but what I wanted to point out and ask about is the summer programming for reading and um, math, the Title One piece. Mm -hmm. I feel like every year we are presented with similar numbers that you know we invite a number a, a lot of students and very few <coughs> students attend and it seems like I mean I'm sure there are a lot of reasons but I think one of them is that they're invited for I believe like an hour of time um, for each of these <coughs> subjects and <clears throat> there's there's is there I guess what I'm trying to understand is is there a way to coordinate with ACE or the rec department or some way for it to become a day long or even a full morning so that we could get more students choosing to attend. Because I think a big issue here is that families don't have an hour in their summer, you know, each day to bring them to this to this program. Um, so um, that is part of the work <coughs> of the team uh, right now. We're looking at, number one, the feedback that we receive from families, which is similar to what you stated. It's a very inconvenient program, to be honest with you, in terms of the offerings to families. It's, it's just, it's hard for families to really take advantage of it. And although there's some really great work taking place during that hour, and it's specialized, and it's in small groups um, in general, we have to look at the offering to make it a little bit more accessible for more families. And so that's part of what we're going to be doing, which is looking at different models that exist in different districts, but also looking at some of the needs that families have vocalized to us, which is which include, you know, students are participating in other town programs, and is there a way that we can maybe link up with those programs so that we can offer more of a fuller program and a fuller experience for students, and that is part of what we're going to be looking at and thinking about shifting. Okay, thank you. I'm maybe <clears throat> in the spring we could get an update on where this is for next summer so that we can hear the progress that's um, that's been made and if that needs to happen in CIAA instead, that's fine, but I just think it's important that we hear um, how adjustments are being made. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Um, Dr. Allison Effie. I just wanted to second what Ms. Exton said. She mm -hmm. hit you. exactly what I was concerned about, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Superintendent Holman. I just want to thank Dr. Ford Walker and Ms. Brzezzi for your leadership of our summer programming. I know that we got a really 
clear picture this year of what some of the challenges are and a lot of really great ideas from some of our Title I coordinators and other folks running programs who were newer to running the programs about what we could do to coordinate those efforts and we're looking forward to making some adjustments. So thank you both for all the time you've put into yeah, this work. Thank you, it's really great. In the summer, um, I just will share one comment for a teacher. They're like, this is what teaching used to be, you know, <laughs> um, having that, um, authenticity of creating a lesson connected to the real world like in in, in a nice laid back environment so um, when it comes time next summer before the program I will make sure to get invitations so you can come visit wherever that's going to be and I agree with Dr. Homan to kind of solidify all the resources together but thank you thank you thank you for your leadership too yeah your your school committee chair is SEI endorsed <laughs> um, no I I, want, I, I I will comment just as a longtime member of the committee that every year we seem to be getting better on our summer programming the fact that we're sitting here right now thinking about well this is good what do we do to get to the next level is a very positive sign I mean we've got a very firm foundation we're, and, and I think we can be proud of what we're doing and I'm really grateful that we've got a team that's willing to take a look at it and see how we take it to the next level and I appreciate the hard work for everybody involved in the summer program I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, superintendent's update. All right. Thank you, Chair Schlickman. We're going to hope that my battery lives through this presentation. Um, my computer battery is dying. Um, so I want to start with a preview of our outcomes for 2024. These were published for the state, and I shared a press release with all of you um, earlier this week, and then we shared it with the, our media um, outlets uh, that same day. So I am pleased to report that Arlington Public Schools is um, meeting or exceeding targets across the board. Oh, thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, and that we have met and exceeded targets on all of the outcomes that uh, for all students that DESE reports on a district level. Um, and I have some of the highlights here in K, ELA, and math. We've exceeded targets in high school ELA. We've met targets. High school math exceeded targets, K-8 and high school science exceeded targets. In language proficiency, which is uh, measuring the extent to which our uh, multilingual learners are gaining prof language proficiency at the rate that they are expected to by the state, we've met targets. Uh, in participation in advanced coursework met targets, K-8 chronic absenteeism met targets, and in high school chronic absenteeism exceeded targets. All of this is spectacular, and I want to highlight one win, uh, one major win, which is that we cut chronic absenteeism for students with disabilities by 6% at the high school level. Um, and there are a number of other things tied to focal groups that we're going to be talking about in the outcomes report. So that mm -hmm. report will be at the next meeting, um, but I wanted to highlight a few uh, of these things because they'll be highlighted if um, there are any reports done on our accountability um, designations or outcomes by school. We'll dig in a lot more on focal groups in the reporting on outcomes as well. Uh, so I, I do also want to highlight that we have certainly, this is for all students across all measured categories, the all students category. We still have work to do for some focal groups and to the point we were just making about um, Title I, one of the major uh, things we're discovering about our outcomes is that we need to do some more targeted work around uh, students from families that are income insecure uh, from our low income families and Title I programming is designed to help those students mm -hmm. and so we need to think about what the realities are for families who are needing to work on a daily basis and all day long and make sure that our programming is meeting those needs so that's something we'll be focusing on and we'll talk more about the actions that we plan to take this year when we do our outcomes report on October 10th I'd like to share that the LGBTQIA plus task force back to school is holding a back to school gathering on the AHS front lawn this coming Saturday from 12 to 2 so if you are out walking around or happen to come by Mass Ave, please feel free to stop by. Uh, we'll be making some connections and the uh, Rainbow Alliances will be selling pizza and having sing-alongs and doing art projects. So please feel free to join them. Uh, we do have a town delegation traveling to Nagaokakyo. How'd I do, Mr. Schlickman? Nagaokakyo. Nagaokakyo. Yeah. I'm gonna get better at this before next mm -hmm. week. Um, Japan for our sister city 40th anniversary. Uh, it's a small delegation. Uh, Mr. Schlickman and I are going. Uh, Ms. Pierre, our director of community engagement, will also be joining. That department will be taking over some of the coordination of the, of the student visits when they come 
uh, to APS in the future. And so it'll be great for us to make that connection with that department so that we can make sure that our, we have host families for the student visits when we, they come this spring. Um, and we are, I also wanted to share that we're going to be exploring a uh, special education program review and getting some recommendations from um, some outside consultants. I'll have more to share on this uh, very soon, but we've been in a conversation with a consultant um, looking to take a look at staffing models, understanding that we need to uh, put the joint committee together that was in the bargaining agreement to look at caseloads. And I think it would be great to have some recommendations as we head into budget season and as we um, start working on that committee that we could work from and that we could use uh, the individuals who uh, we're considering working with have uh, extensive experience in special education in multiple districts and so we're hoping that they can help bring some data to the conversation take a look at our data with us and give us some ideas that can help us make sure that we continue to meet the needs of our students with disabilities to the greatest extent possible uh, we will be doing um, some SEL self-assessments uh, this year as part of our panorama rollout with the students. This is replacing CELIS assessments that we've done in the past as well as mental health screeners. We did a pilot at Bishop and, Bishop and Thompson last year of the SEL self-assessments. It's sort of, it's like, it's, it's the same platform as they take the survey on, except these assessments are, uh, they provide data to the teacher about the skills that students report having, um, skills that they could maybe build, that we could build into the curriculum. And we think it, it operates as a stronger tool for tier for informing tier one instruction or informing classroom instruction um, and, and, and instruction around skill building, around social emotional learning. And so we're gonna do a full rollout. Families can opt out of this and we have a mechanism to ensure that if a family opts out that it, the student won't have any access to the um, survey in the platform if the family opts out. And so we're making sure that, that if a family opts out that there's no way their student will be able to take the assessment we do have a few back to school nights left in October, um, and it's been wonderful to see families. We've had some record turnouts at this year's back to school nights, and uh, we've had some really positive reviews and excited um, notes about the start of the school year and gratitude to our teachers who are spending their evenings giving spectacular presentations and having a lot of enthusiasm about the school year ahead. So thanks to all of our teachers for the efforts that you've put into our back to school nights. Um, and I have several celebrations and then we'll be done. So I wanna say congratulations to our APS National History Day students. Um, our programs that have been very successful and competitive at the national level were honored at the State House for the MA250 launch, which is the 250th anniversary, launch of the 250th anniversary of our, of the birth of the United States. Uh, and so we'll be celebrating that in collaboration with Town of Arlington over the next many months, and it was exciting that we got to be included in the state's launch of programming for that. Uh, I wanna say congratulations to Luna, uh, Lou Hogan, who is a Mandarin teacher at OMS and has been recognized as the Massachusetts Foreign Language Association Teacher of the Year for 2024. Um, we're gonna do more, a little more celebration of world languages at some future meetings um, because we also wanna celebrate Abby Holt, who is a Latin teacher at OMS, um, and was recognized by the Classical Association of Massachusetts for the Excellence in Teaching Award for 2024. So we're, going, we're very excited for them. Um, these awards are being announced very soon and we're hoping to have them come and also the World Language Department soon to tell you a little bit about some of the great work that's happening in our world languages. Um, we have a number of other things that are going on this month aligned with strategic priorities uh, that we are working on this year. We're rebooting instructional rounds. We'll have smaller groups of leaders uh, joining schools for frequent opportunities to get into classrooms and using some shared tools to align what we're seeing in classrooms and have some productive discussions about uh, what deeper learning is, what it looks like in instruction, uh, so that we can start to build some common language around that. We started our central office monthly meeting and uh, we will be doing inclusive workspace series launch with our central office team. We started those meetings today and our goal is to make sure that all of our employees, including those who reside here at central office in a lot of different functions and roles are getting opportunities to connect with one another and get some professional learning in as well, um, that we're not only doing professional learning with our educators, but we're doing it with our paraprofessionals and those in other roles too. 
We are launching a two-way school messenger chat pilot at Thompson this fall. Uh, this is a feature that school messenger has uh, that allows for back and forth messaging. Um, it has some limit, so we're gonna be putting some parameters and boundaries around this because we certainly don't want teachers to feel like they need to respond to chat messages um, mm -hmm. at hours when they should be spending time with their families. Mm -hmm. But what it does allow is um, teachers use this on their computers, but families can use it more easily on their phones. Mm -hmm. So they could send a quick message to a teacher or if, if there's some them back and forth, um, then a teacher can keep that open during the day and potentially have some shorter messages um, and two-way communication. Uh, teachers uh, at Thompson, are, we're looking forward to piloting some of this and we'll be giving some guidelines and professional development to the teachers as well to make sure that everybody is on the same page about how to use it, when to use it, what it's best for um, to be used and when it's better to default to email. We have um, our capital request that we talked with you about today, and we're excited that those will be incorporating some technology needs as well to support uh, connection for all of our students and staff. When it comes to administrative hiring, we wanna welcome back to the role of OMS Assistant Principal Maureen Murphy. She's been an assistant principal for us um, in the past, and she's stepping in, uh, and we have a vacancy, we had a vacancy early in the school year at OMS. She's stepping in as acting assistant principal um, and we're very glad to have her in that critical role. And we are in the process of hiring for Director of Finance and initial interviews will be next week. Mr. Gorski is leading that search and we'll have updates for you at, a future, at future meetings. Enrollments are in your materials and I believe that is all. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions or comments from the committee? Looking around the room. Just looking to get a view to make sure my remote members are okay. I can't see them. Okay, cameras are off, so I assume that everybody's fine. Um, consent agenda. Thank you, Superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, look forward to the uh, follow up uh, at the next meeting. Uh, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant 25069, September 24th, 2024, in the amount of $706,266.27, and warrant number 25085, September 26, 2024, in the amount of $75,850.34, plus the minutes of the meeting on September 12th. Looking for a motion to approve, Mr. Thielman. Motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Dr. Allison Appy to approve the consent agenda roll call. Ms. Exton uh, is, is not with us at this point. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Appy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Chair votes the affirmative six nothing unanimous vote. Next subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Budget. Dr. Allison Appy. So budget met this morning. Um, we started, we talked about last year, this year, next year, how we're gonna do the budget process. And then Mr. Gorski updated me late this afternoon that we have a final, that they have closed out the number from last year and that this final surplus, we were in surplus, which everyone understands, um, of $17,461.80. So that was higher than what he had told us, but it's a number that moves around a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in fact, are you saying, I'm sorry, can that still change or is this like the, the it's done? Mr. Gorski. That is the final closed number for FY24 for the district. Okay, so the, the, the we're town done, closed we, the ended in, we ended in surplus. Um, so, and we will meet again on October 10th. Congratulations, Mr. Gorski, you got it done. <laughs> 
Um, next would be community relations. Dr. Ms. Exton is not with us. Is there anybody on the committee who has anything to add? Seeing none, CIAA, Ms. Morgan. Yes, we are meeting on October 7th, um, and we're going to talk about outcomes in advance of talking about those at the full committee and uh, secondary level class sizes. Excellent. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No discussion, no report. We discussed the capital. Okay. Plan. Policies and procedures, Mr. Cardin. Um, we will look to set up a meeting in October. I look forward to it. AHS Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet on Monday, no, I'm, I'm sorry, on Tuesday. The project is uh, moving forward and, you know, if you have ideas for names for those seven spaces in the middle school, in the high school, just uh, let us know. Thank you. Um, any liaison reports? Any announcements? Any future agenda items? At that point, we have concluded the uh, public agenda. We now look to go to executive session for, uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares, which the chair is now declaring. Uh, we will be discussing a draft cafeteria MOA with a AFSCME Local 680 and uh, negotiations with the AAA. Looking for a motion. Motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Uh, roll call. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative. That's a six nothing vote. We will not be returning yeah. to public. <coughs> oh, we will be returning <coughs> to public session? If to vote it. Do we need to do that tonight or will we, we? They could allow us to implement. Mm -hmm with a vote at the next at the start of the next meeting. Yeah, we'll, we'll vote at the next start of the next okay. meeting. We will not be returning to public session after the executive session. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.